Today what we're going to do is this. We're going to obviously continue in going through the book of Matthew, and we're going to have four very clear points from our, our chunk of Scripture today. The first point today is a verse. It's James chapter 1, verse 22. So if you're a note taker, that's the first point. Write that down, James 1.22. And here's why this is our point. James 1.22 says this, says, Do not just be hearers of the word and deceive yourselves, but do what it says. And I don't know about you, but me personally, as I look back over the last few weeks, month, two months, I, I think we've had some messages where, where we've been pretty challenged or encouraged. We've had messages where we've made decisions to do things, and, and that's where I get I, I go back to this James 1.22 verse, because it, I think it's important that we don't get in the habit of just going to church, sitting through a service, hoping we get entertained, hoping the music is good, everything better be on point, and then we leave, only to come back the next week with the same kind of a mindset, okay, I'm, the music should be good, I don't want it too loud, I don't want it too soft, the guitar should be on, the drums better be on beat, Denise's voice should sound good, I'm going to listen to a message where I better be entertained, and then I'm going to leave and I'm going to come back, I'm going to do it next week. And I think for some of us, we get in that habit. We get in the habit of church just being something either we have to sit through or something, well, I'll go, but it better be good. And we hear things, but the challenge is, is do we apply it? Because I'm going to tell you this, as much as I love to see you guys, I hope and pray that when you come to church, come to our church, I'm not talking about anybody else's church, when you come to our church here, I hope you come with a desire to worship God and with a desire to hear from God. That's what I hope you come with. But then when you do hear from God, because I don't believe that God is the variable in that equation. I believe we are. So when you do hear from God, what do you do with that then? James 1.22, do not just be hearers of the word and deceive yourselves, but do what it says. What I want to do is I want to start in Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 1, and we're going we're gonna to reread a few verses. And as we reread, as we reread, <laughs> verse 1, let's just start. It says this, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Now, this isn't really part of the, the program, but it sticks out to me. Make no mistake about it, Jesus knew what he was walking into, but he still went because it was his Father's will. It was God's plan. Remember that? He still went, knowing what he was walking into, knowing the struggle, he still went. Continue reading in verse 3, it says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the festival. They said, or there may be a riot among the people. Now, a few weeks ago or a month ago by now, when we talked about that particular scripture, one of the points in that message, Stephanie, was this, was God's plan is different than our plan. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, through the prophet, the Lord is saying, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And the challenge that day that I believe many of us felt was this, is are you listening to God? You see, we've got to remember, church, that when Jesus went to the cross, on the way there, he stopped at the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed a prayer. He said, God... Father, if this can be done a different way, that would be great. Yet not my will, but your will be done. You see, if God is asking you to do something that doesn't fit your agenda, are you still willing to do it? So as we go back, Chris, a month to that message, did the Lord speak to you then? And if he did, were you just a hearer of the word or did you do something with what he spoke to you? 
Let's continue reading in verse 6. It says, While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Now, this message a few weeks ago, maybe some of you remember it, the title of it was Religion Versus Relationship. Because what we did, and and again, I I keep forgetting to look it up, but I believe it's in Luke chapter 7 was where we went back and we read. I could be wrong. But what we did was we read a a, a different account of, of an event similar to this happening. A sinful woman, remember, that was emphasized in the scripture, a sinful woman came into the house of the Pharisee, a religious person. And the sinful woman came in and broke this alabaster jar of expensive expensive perfume on Jesus, poured it on Jesus. The Bible says that she washed his feet with her tears, dirty, dusty, stinky feet. She got down on her hands and knees, and her tears rushed off her face onto his dirty feet. And the Pharisees, this religious person, this group of religious people, all they could do was sit there and condemn her. If he really knew this woman and what she's done, he wouldn't want her anywhere near him, they thought. And you see, there's a great picture right there of the difference between a religion and a relationship. We were challenged that day. A religion focuses simply on the external. Simply on what, what do the other people think? Am I going to surrender my life? Am I going to raise my hands? And get, am I going to hit my knees? I love looking back during worship. I love, it's a, such a treat. You guys have heard me say this. It's a treat to stand here and watch you worship. Have this intimate time with the Lord. To get to see people wiping tears. And I, and I look back today and I see somebody kneeling with their face on their seat. Unashamed. Who cares what anybody else thinks? Because I'm not here about religion. I'm here because I have a relationship with Jesus. You see, that's this sinful woman. That's the difference between the religion where it's simply about the external. Remember, Jesus challenged the religious people. says, you're like whitewashed tombs. You make the outside look real good. But on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones. And we were challenged that day to examine ourselves. Are you more concerned with how you look on the outside? Or are you concerned with having a relationship with Jesus? Not caring what other people think. Not letting that dictate who you are. See, there's another piece to that. Now, now I am not, believe it or not, because I know I get worked up up here, and some of you might stand and you might think, man, he's, he's just angry, you know? Anybody out there just think I'm angry? Thanks for not, did you raise your hand? My dad, my dad raised his hand. I am not, I am not an angry person. I'm not filled with bitterness and hatred and all that stuff. But I want you to understand something. When I start thinking of, of people who've made mistakes in their lives and are, they have these amazing gifts and talents that, that I believe with all of my heart that God has given us. Anybody else believe that? God puts inside of us. God wires us. God creates us. And it makes me so angry inside when somebody who's made mistakes doesn't use those gifts because they think that God doesn't want to use them for anything. And that feeling comes from religious people. Religious people who say, if they knew what you did, 
And so it causes us to not use those gifts. And that's something, church, I'm going to tell you this. It, it just makes me mad. Because there's far too many people who have been given amazing gifts by God that sit there and don't use them because we're so afraid of what somebody else in our church might think. And I think that's terrible. And I, and I, I, I read something like this. Jesus says of this sinful woman, you got to slow down and read your Bible. Slow down, because she is a sinful woman. And Jesus says what she has done, listen to me, what she has done will be repeated to everybody who reads the gospel, everybody who hears the gospel. Do you know what that means, Monty? From that day, 2,000 plus years ago now, how many people have heard of this amazing thing that this sinful woman did? That day we talked about the fact that God uses who he wants to use. Amen? If you're sitting there, if you're sitting there and you are allowing a mistake or your past dictate what you do or do not do that God is asking you to do, I want to please, please listen to God's voice above the voice of the religious people that put you down. Amen? Let his voice, the voice of truth, be the strongest. Let's read a little bit more. I could get off on that rant for a long time. I'm passionate about that. It makes me so mad. But I'm not angry. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hunting helps that. Do you know that? <laughs> All right, moving on. Oh, my gosh. Verse, uh, are we at verse 14 in Matthew 26? All right. This says this, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? And so they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Now, this was just a couple weeks ago, and you guys that uh, at this service, I wasn't here last Sunday, but again, I know Denise did a fantastic job sharing her message I wasn't here because I got the opportunity to share at our Forest Lake campus. And this message, the message that I shared here a couple weeks ago, is the one I shared because I think it's one of the more powerful messages that we've had in, in recent weeks. And I think challenging. The question that we asked in that message was this, do you have a price? Because Judas's price was 30 pieces of silver for him to turn his back on Jesus, for him to walk away from Jesus. And the question is, do, do you, do we have a price, a circumstance in life that could cause us to walk away, to turn our back on this relationship we have with him? A chemical, a relationship. Do you have a price? Now, I, I love the fact that you all pretty much agree with me that we, we would say this, like, adamantly. We would say, no, I don't have a price, right? I love Jesus. Anybody else love Jesus in the room? I love Jesus. I, I don't have a price. There's three of us in our church today that love Jesus. We're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to start over. You guys are angry. But I love Jesus, and, and we would adamantly say, I don't, there's no price. I would never turn my back on him. I'd never walk away from him. I would, there's nothing. And so then we were challenged, say, okay, then we need to protect that. Amen? We need to protect that relationship. Well, here's the deal. Did you hear that word? Realize, hey, that's true. I need to protect this relationship. Because some of us, we love Jesus and, and we haven't walked away, but we're teetering a little bit. We're toying with some things. Say, I got to protect that. Did you hear it and then did you do? Do you understand what I'm saying? Did you do what needs to be done to protect that relationship? Because again, we all agree, it's not going to get any easier to walk with Jesus in the world we live in today. Are you protecting that relationship? But then there was the other side of this coin where I said this. Maybe some of you, you, you you're sitting here with a heavy heart and you, you already say, I, I, the price has already been paid. I'm in church, but I've walked away from the Lord. Maybe I'm, I'm watching online because I can't bring myself to go to church because I've walked away from the Lord. And then we said, then just come back. Luke chapter 15, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible it's all about coming back. A coin that's lost, a sheep that gets separated, 
the prodigal son. It's, it's, a, it's just a wonderful set of scriptures. And we said, come back. And there were many of you between our three services, many that stood and said, I, I want to come back. I've wandered off. I want to come back. Last weekend at the Forest Lake campus when I shared this, it was beautiful. Over 20 people stood up saying, I want to come back. But then here's my challenge, though, and you got to hear this. My challenge is this. You see, standing up in church or raising our hand or nodding or coming to the altar or something, that's a great first step, right, Sean? That's a great first step, but you know what? It's what you do when you leave here that really makes the difference. You see, that's what I believe. That's what James 1.22 speaks to me. Not just being hearers, but doing. And so if you're one of the many over the last couple weekends that said, I want to come home. Did you? What over the last seven days or 14 days has changed in your life to draw you closer to God then? That's why this first point, I think, it's so important. James 1.22, do not just be hearers of the word and be deceived you guys, this isn't it. Coming to church, this isn't it. It doesn't matter how great of a church you go to. That's not it. It's what you choose to do with your life. It's what you choose to do with your relationship with God. Amen? The first point today, James 1.22, do not just be hearers of the word, but do what it says. The second point today is is. It's just simply this. Write this down if you're taking notes. Traditions. We're going to read another verse in Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. Here's what it says. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And now again, we're going to stop right there. The second point, traditions. I, I believe that there's so many of us we, we read through the Bible, and because we are Gentile Americans, Gentile meaning non-Jewish people, and we, we come to the Western church, and life is busy, and, and, and there's so many of us that we, we just fly through our Bible, we read through some of this stuff without really seeing the picture. Matthew, the author of the book we're reading, he is Jewish. He's writing to a Jewish audience, of which I'm pretty sure most of us aren't. And so it, it's good to just pause, slow down, and understand things a little more. And that's what I want to do today a little bit with you, is this, is talk about traditions. You guys doing good? Still with me? Yeah. All right. Traditions. So second point, write that down. Traditions. Now, this Passover meal, a Seder meal, which we talked about a few weeks ago, very, very beautiful uh, process or ceremony, I want, I want to show you just a little bit more of it in talking about some of the traditions. There's a very specific order. There's a very specific plate or meal that is set out. And each of the items have a very specific meaning. Matt, it's important we understand this. Every piece of this that I'm going to tell you about right now, it's for one purpose. To remember, as a Jewish person, to remember God bringing the Israelites up out of Egypt. It's as simple as that. Sometimes things get so complicated and hard to understand. <laughs> I'm a simple guy. That's, it's easy to understand. Everything they're doing in this meal, the Passover celebration, it all has to do with remembering this amazing thing that God did in bringing them up out of Egypt and setting them free from slavery. Here's a few of the pieces of, of this meal, what's on this table. The first is this. There's a roasted... Lamb shank bone. Very important symbolism represented here. On the day of the Passover, when the Israelites, God was finally going to get them released out of Egypt and Pharaoh was going to let them go, the final plague that happened was the death of all of the firstborn in Egypt. And God told the Israelites, here's what you need to do. You need to sacrifice a lamb. And you take that blood and you put it on your door frame. And when I pass through, I will see that blood and, and I will 
pass over your house. Okay? That's why even till today, thousands of years later, even today, there's Jewish people, when they do this, there's that bone to remind them of the sacrifice and to remind them of being passed over. Another item that's on the table is a hard-boiled egg. And again, most of this stuff has little variations, as you can imagine, but many, the symbolism of this hard-boiled egg is it represents newness or springtime. But it also represents the sacrifice that was, that was done before the Passover celebration during the, the second temple period. The third item that's on there is a bitter herb. And by this, something along the lines of horseradish or endive. And now this, listen to this. Again, keep this in mind now. Everything they're doing points to this whole time, their time in Egypt as slaves and the Lord setting them free. So this bitter herb represents the bitterness of their slavery, the difficulty of their slavery. Then there's a paste that they would mix up. And it's kind of a sweet salad. I remember one time many years ago, I participated in one of these, and this was my favorite part of this whole thing. It's made of uh, apples, nuts, wine, and cinnamon. And it's, it's made into this paste or this little salad. Now listen to this, Stephanie. Here's what this represents. It represents the mortar that was used to make the bricks while the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. Because that's what they were forced to do, is make all these bricks. Isn't that interesting? I just think that's so cool. There's another green uh, vegetable, usually something like parsley. That represents the new birth of the Spirit. And then there's a, a bowl or a cup of salt water. And the salt water represents the tears and the sweat, again, from the misery of their being enslaved. And then finally, as, of course, as you know, there is unleavened bread, three or four pieces of unleavened bread um, and unleavened bread, it's just bread that's made without yeast in it. The yeast is what causes the bread to rise, and, and, and they didn't have it. The symbolism there is they had to leave in haste. And so they didn't have time to let the bread rise, and so they had to eat unleavened bread. And so that's just a small picture. But here's what I love about this. Linda, listen to this. I love the fact that... Not the religious part of this where it's like I feel like I have to go through this. Do you know what I mean? It's not it's, it's this, the oppressiveness uh, that comes from religion. I don't love that part. But I love the symbolism. Because the whole point of doing this is so that they never forget what God did for Israel. How many of us, we forget what God has done for us. Life gets a little bit hard, and now we, we just get mad. We're, we're more like the Israelites wandering in the desert, right? You know what I'm talking about? Where it's like you just kind of wavering back and forth. God, you're the greatest. A day later when it's hard, where the heck, God? And God saves us. God, you're the greatest. I mean, that's many of our walk with the Lord. And we forget what God has done. And that's what I like about something like this. It's like it's so intentional about remembering. Now, they... Part of this seven-day feast is that they cannot have any yeast in the house for the entire time. Can't be there. And so what they do, actually, even till today now, they'll start weeks in advance cleaning all the yeast out of the house. Now, you would think, well, why does, why does it take weeks? Because isn't it just like you get the leavened bread and you get the snacks and you get the crackers, you get all that out? It's not that easy. What they do is they even go to the point of, of cleaning, like in the corners. How many of you know that stuff gathers in the corners? Doesn't it? Lint? Oh, my goodness. But the same thing, even as simple as crumbs. They don't even want crumbs from leaven to bread or crackers with yeast in it left in the corners. So they clean everything. Even going to the point of cleaning behind the fridge, under the stove. I mean, like, they really want to get all the yeast out. And, and, and now, a part of their traditions, Dean, is this, is they, they want to draw the kids in, you know? That's what we need to do in order to keep things in front of us, isn't it? We, we need to have our kids involved. And so what they'll do is actually, a lot of them, they'll, they'll take and they'll hide uh, one or, or numerous 
like pieces of leavened bread or loaves of leavened bread or crackers or something. They'll hide it around the house, and then the, the morning before the Passover begins, they make it a game for the kids where they have to go and they have to find it. And as they find it, then they get a prize. But what they do with it is they bring it out and they burn it. And it's kind of neat, isn't it? it? Again, it's keeping it in front of the kids. Some of us got to do a lot better job keeping everything God has done for us in front of our kids. Amen? The third point today is it's cleaning our house. Cleaning our house. And here's what I mean by this. There's a lot of us that have a lot of yeast inside of us. I believe it's, is it Luke chapter 12? I believe Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Yeast or leaven throughout the Bible is used as an image of or a symbol of, of sin, or Jesus very clearly says it, hypocrisy, legalism, religiousness. And so as we look at this now and we think, okay, do I need to clean my house? Have I let the yeast of these things get in to my life and affect me? It's easy to clean the outside. I'm talking about the inside. Stuff like pride. Have we let that get in and affect us? Remember the Bible says a little yeast... Changes the whole batch. Have we allowed that little bit in to throw us off track? And, and again, for some maybe it's, it's that pride, it's that legalism, it's that religiousness. For some, it's, it's a sinful lifestyle that we have knowingly, willingly allowed in. For some, it's stuff like gossip. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of these things that we open the door and we let in and that, that yeast gets in. And, and, and it's something that, that we want to have out of the house. Amen? Here's the interesting thing that, that I, I learned about yeast is yeast is everywhere. You guys know that? It's in the air. My um, Denise's family, every year they do this thing called Soup Day. And, and for Soup Day, which it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's just a reason to gather the family together. Like it's a holiday for their family. Like when you walk in, they say, Happy soup day. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, it's, it's soup day. But what they do is everybody brings a different kind of soup, and it's a competition. So we had, there was like 12 or 14 different kinds of soup, and we did this a month or two ago. And it's just great. Jerry, you go in, and you just eat. And it's just like, who doesn't like that, you know? It's like, you just eat. And it's all kinds of soup, all, all kinds of stuff. And one of her nieces made homemade sourdough bread. Yeah, listen to you guys. <laughs> Somebody's hungry. <laughs> but, but like homemade to the point of like even homegrown yeast to make the sourdough bread. Because yeast, it's just in the air. It just is. It's there. So now let me, let me ask you something. You have this lady that's trying to clean her house and get all of the yeast out of her house. Can she ever really get all the yeast out of her house? She can't. But does it mean she doesn't try? She does still try, doesn't she? You see, there's some of us, we have this mindset, sin is everywhere, which it is. And so there's some of us that say, so why try? He's going to forgive me anyway. Why try? There's a term for that. You guys have heard it. You've been in the circles long enough. It's called cheap grace. What we do is say, why try? He's going to forgive me. Why try? He loves me anyway. Why try? And what I want to do is challenge us with that today, that we should do some cleaning of our houses. Even though we know this, we'll never be able to get all of it. Because we're sinful people. 
But it doesn't mean we don't try. In Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, what shall we say then? He says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Should we just keep sinning and sinning and sinning so we can experience more and more of God's grace? He goes on and he says this. He says, by no means. Absolutely not. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? You see, some of us, we just excuse things. The yeast that we let in. The pride, the legalism, the arrogance, the ego, the gossip, the lifestyles. We just dismiss it and say, what difference does it make? And I, I think that we need to clean a little bit. Even though we can't get it all, we need to clean. Now listen to me. I believe that there are some religious people where this cleaning is, is an oppressive burden. Do you know what I mean by that? It's a, it's a weight that they carry. There's this pressure to feel like I, I have to get every piece of it out. And that's miserable. It's a terrible way to live. What I'm suggesting is that we do what we do out of a love relationship. Because when we do it that way, it's not oppressive. Amen? It's a, it's a want to, not a have to. I want to clean my house. I want to, to get as much sin as I can out. I want to do this because I want to walk as close with Jesus as I possibly can. Amen? Even though we can't get it all, we still try. And that brings me to my fourth point, which is this. Write this down. You guys, if there's one thing you take away today, I would ask that it would be this. I would pray that it would be this. The fourth point today is this. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. There's a, this phrase that entered my head sometime this last week while we were out of town, and I was thinking about this message. This phrase came in, and, and again, I don't know if it's, if it's right, I don't know if it's, you know, a theologically good thing to say or not. So I'm just going to throw it out there. But I, I happen to really like this phrase. It's, it says this. It's this. I'm going to do my best. I'll do my best. And I mean that. God, I'm going to do my best to, to be the best husband I can be. I'm going to do my best to be the best dad I can be. Clearly, I have to work on being a better son. It's not so angry. But I'm going to do the best I can. Anybody else, you can relate to that? God, I'm going to do the best I can. God, I'm going to do my best. But I know I'm going to fail. I'm going to do my best. And God, I need you to do the rest. You guys, we need Jesus. There is yeast everywhere. There is sin everywhere. It doesn't mean we don't try. But it does mean, God, I'm going to do my best. I don't do this because, again, of this oppressive burden of legalism. I do it because I love you. I, I want to serve you. I want to walk with you. I want to know you, and I want, I want to do this intimately. It's out of that relationship, God, that I want to do my best for you. I want to do my best, but I'm going to fail, and I need you to do the rest. You guys, we need Jesus because it's everywhere. It doesn't make it okay. I'll do my best. But I need you to do the rest. We need Jesus. Amen? At our 60 plus meeting uh, a couple weeks ago now, one of the ladies that was there, if you don't know, her name's Connie Gamerick. And she shared this, kind of this vision that the Lord had given her, a vision slash conversation she had with him. She tells the story of standing at the kitchen window. I believe she was doing dishes and she's looking out and just kind of thinking and praying. And, and, and she said to the Lord, she said, Lord, I don't understand righteousness. I just don't understand righteousness. 
And she felt the Lord speak to her. As she's looking out, she's looking out, and it's just, it, it was wintertime, and there was this covering of white snow. And there's a shed in the backyard of their home at the time. And the Lord says, you see that shed? Yeah. Well, inside that shed, it's kind of a mess. But when I look down, all I see is the beautiful white snow. That's it. Even though the shed is a mess, all I see is this beautiful white snow. And that's righteousness. It's not something that we can earn. It's something that comes simply because of Jesus. It doesn't mean we don't try and organize the shed. It doesn't mean we don't try and clean the shed. Amen? But what God sees is something that it's just this covered in white beautiful thing because of Jesus. The Bible says that his blood makes us white as snow. Now, since she shared that, that image has been in my head because I think it's a great picture. You see, we need Jesus. We'll do our very best, but we need him to do the rest. Amen? 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You see, there's some of us that think we don't need Jesus because, because we're all that. And I want to encourage you with this challenge. That's the yeast of legalism and pride. Gets in there and makes us think we're good enough. We don't really need Jesus. If we claim to be without sin, the truth is not in us and we deceive ourselves. Verse 9 says this. I love it. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We are made righteous only because of his blood. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, salvation is not something that you can earn, but it is a gift. Amen? Guys, today I want to encourage you with this. Please, don't come and go from church just because it's something you do. Please, if God stirs in you, if God speaks to you, which I believe he does, take that with you. Don't just be hearers of the word, but doers. These traditions, these things that we, we look back to our Jewish ancestors, the early church, as we see these things that, that they do, that they've done for many years, and there's so much we can learn from that. Some of us need to do some house cleaning because we've let some yeast get in. But as we do that, man, don't feel oppressed. Feel free. And know that, man, we need Jesus. Amen. We need Jesus.